Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I am your host, Ray Harkins. We are sitting here at episode number 27. I realize that I always say sitting here like that is something that's actually happening. We're sitting here on number 27. Anyways, that's not relevant. But what is relevant is our partnership with PropertyOfZach.com. Great website. Visit them, PropertyOfZach.com, like I just said two seconds ago. Uh, They're doing awesome stuff over there. Not only do they post the latest and greatest news of all your bands, tours, new records, all that type of stuff, but they do a lot of in-depth editorial coverage like mixtapes from bands. Uh, They have a really, really cool new feature that goes more in-depth on um, various recording industry things like uh, they just posted an article recently on vinyl and pressing vinyl and how sometimes that gets delayed and yeah there's just really cool stuff on there so visit the site we are proud to be partnered up with them um anyways our guest today is mr mark capacato you think i should have done that before i actually recorded that but no that's not what happens sometimes uh anyways mark mark capacato from glamour kills clothing And I apologize in advance, Mark, for butchering your name. I said it when we talked on the phone, but I'm an idiot. But anyways, Glamour Kills Clothing is an amazing clothing company from New York City, if you are not familiar with. Uh, They are very, very visible and out there in regards to Warp Tour, Bamboozle, all that type of stuff. Um, And it is literally a homegrown family business. Um, his, as you will find out in the interview, his mom helps him run the company, his sister works there, and it's just a, a very cool story. Um, and I've known Mark for on and off for the past, like maybe two years or so. And, uh, just knowing him as a person a little bit, I was like, this dude will be a perfect guest because he obviously has an interesting story. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's why I had him on there, but let's get some business out of the way before we dive in. Uh, review the show on iTunes. Go there, spend two minutes, type in a few thoughts about the show, what you think is cool, what you think sucks, whatever the case may be. Um, and then if you wanted to spend even less time, you can just click on the amount of stars that you think the show is worth. Because the more stuff that we have going on with that, the better rankings we get in iTunes. And then, fingers crossed, one of these days will be featured somewhere prominent on the iTunes site being like, yo, check this podcast out. And then I'll make my millions of dollars, which is exactly why I'm doing the podcast to begin with. Note the sarcasm. Anyways, uh, and then also visit the website, 100wordspodcast.com. You can find more stuff that's happening in between the episodes that I post. It's usually just recommendations of music, movies, pop culture stuff that I trip across. So uh, visit that. And if you're a Tumblr fan, you can follow it that way too. Um, yes, but before we really dive into the interview, I also wanted to bring back one of my close personal friends and what I like to call the cultural correspondent to 100 Words or Less, the podcast, Scott Arnold, where he shares some of the let's say offbeat things that he has come across so let's uh let's join a conversation there broadcasting in the Louvre in paris <laughs> our our cultural correspondent the man of the man on the streets man of the people scott arnold good day yes so uh what do you what do you have for us i'm excited we we haven't done this in a while i have three things mm. My first thing is a TV show. Okay. And this show was filmed in 2008 to 2010. Okay. And it's called Departures. Okay. It was a Canadian show. And basically, these two guys that are just out of college decide they want to travel around the world and mm-hmm. film it. So it has a real DIY feel, but the cameraman is really talented. Mm-hmm. So it looks beautiful. It looks like a National Geographic show. Oh, really? Yeah. But these two guys, their like demeanors, totally casual, and they're mm-hmm. just there to have fun. Like sure. one guy's always drunk. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like taking the idea of a 
post college backpacking trip to the extreme. Right. It's really really good. I'd recommend it. Interesting. Interested in travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's a set. What, what did it air on here in America? Or did you just? I don't watch think it was online? on America. Oh, was it on like the CBC or whatever? The I just read about it online and downloaded it. Oh, okay. Legal, I, legally, of course. No, right? I had a hard time finding it. <laughs> <laughs> Illegally. Okay. So uh, go digging for that. Go digging. Okay. Um, it was on the Outdoor Life Network in Canada. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it could have been successful in America? Like, does it have a similar feel to like other? I mean, obviously, it's not a survival show, but like you know, looking at those other shows like that. No, it wasn't. There was no survival right, element. Right, right. It was more Anthony. It was like a cross between the Anthony Bourdain, No Reservations, mm. and like a Vice Guide to Whatever. Oh, that's without fun. the pretentious. Without without the massive amounts of drug use. Right. Maybe there was drug use, but it wasn't as prevalent. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Interesting. I'll check that out. And from the world of computer code, Ooh. I have something that has made my life a lot easier. Really? Okay. Yeah. Shaved hours off of your, your coding tasks. Yes. Okay. It is a Ruby gem called Middleman. Okay. And what this allows you to do, Ray, normally if you're just making a small site, you have to set up a complex development environment to render your coffee script, mm -hmm. your SAS. Okay. Middleman does that all for you. Really? So you can come up with your, your outline and your mock-up. So yeah, it, it, it's kind of just plug and play in a way where you're able yeah. to... Yeah. Wow. Saves hours. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's that saved you a lot of time in your yeah. massive development. Yep. Okay. And finally. Finally. We have an artist that has really touched my heart lately. Okay. I listen to this often. Okay. It's called Scalpel. Scalpel. S-K-A-L-P-E-L. -E <laughs> Sounds like European techno. Polish <laughs> European techno. <laughs> Okay. And it is just by the way that they spell it, or that whoever this person is spells it. Yes. There yeah. are two records. Okay. Both of them are perfect. Okay. There's the self title, and there's also confusion with a K. So he, he obviously has some beef with C, the letter well, C. Well, it's two DJs, and okay. I don't know the story, but it's all like, it's all based on like 40s fringe jazz records. And they mash them up. Wow. With contemporary techno. Interesting. But not techno. Right? Electronic. In the, in the community, we call it... Um, oh, yeah. I don't know. E -D -D. E EDM? EDM. Yeah. The EDM scene? What's that called? Electronic dance music. Oh, no. It's the... <laughs> it's, it's like the mellow drum and bass one. Mm, I don't know. I, I'm not... I'm not injected into that culture as much as it's maybe good. I should be. So that that's... Is that what you put on as your... Coding, like yeah, your work. I'm driving as I'm thinking. Great work music. Mm -hmm. Okay. I also have another one. Oh, off you... the cuff. Hit, hit us. There's a restaurant called the Gratitude Cafe. Cafe Gratitude. Cafe Gratitude. Yes. It opened where I live. It's fantastic. I had Cafe Gratitude for the first time before I saw Beach House the other week. Oh, really? And it was good. I mean, I have nut allergies, like to. Like macadamia nuts and like oh. more exotic nuts, so I have to be careful at sort of man nuts. Man nuts, I'm completely fine with. <laughs> um, but the so a lot of those raw restaurants, I have to watch out what I'm ordering because like uh, you know they they just say the cheese and I'm like what what is right. it what nut is this made out of? But I did enjoy it. I can't remember what I had, but it was really good. It's my favorite. Yeah. What's what's your go-to meal there? What have you had? Every time I've gone, I've had something different. It's okay. All great. And the one that's more in like the Hollywood area, that's like paparazzi is there like five out of the seven days of the week. Really? Because that's like where everybody, everybody who's anybody within the entertainment industry, that's where they go. And so the paparazzi, oh, yeah, 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 paparazzi hang out there. I mean, I know you're on the other side of Los Angeles. On the West Side, right? You're on the fake. You're, you're, little, in, uh, you're in fake hyper. Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> you're a little, a little more bougie, I think yeah. they call it. But anyway, the yes. story behind the restaurant is that you went there, obviously. So mm -hmm. each item is called, like, I am great. Yeah. I am learning. That whole thing is based off some self-help program. Mm -hmm. And this is all hearsay. Yeah. I don't know. This is all... Alleged. T topical research you've done online? Yes. Yes. Evidently, that organization, the owners of the restaurant are involved in that organization. Mm -hmm. And they pressure employees to do it. Oh, okay. So you're supposed to spend your paycheck at this place. And it's gotten the rap that it's run by a cult. Interesting. Do you know the actual name of that sort of self-help? No. Okay, yeah. That sounds, uh, 
I mean, it's kind of like that uh, Loving Hut, like where I don't know if you've ever been to no. a Loving Hut. It's a national chain. Like you can find it anywhere. Like there, there's one in Fountain Valley. There's a lot in Southern California, and it's just kind of you know your typical sort of like vegan Asian food, like you know mock chicken and beef and whatever. But <clears throat> they have the they, and I, I'm again probably same level of knowledge that you have of cafe uh-huh. gratitude is what I have of just what I've seen in the restaurants mm-hmm. there. They have what's called Supreme master television. Mm-hmm. So it's like they have television broadcasting, you know, 24 seven of mm-hmm. this woman who is, it's not like, you know, straight, you know, just looking at the camera type of stuff, but it's like, you know, you see her doing rallies and demonstrations or whatever, where she's got a lot of people listening to what she's saying. And basically she's just professing that, the way that we as humans are treating the planet, like, you know, we're, it's going to be dead in 10 years. Like, you know, there's a lot of this sort of doomsday-ish. But it's it's weird because it's presented in a very, like, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of shots of, you know, f- whatever, fluorescent pastel-like colors. And, like, mm-hmm. you know, happy go, mm-hmm. ha- people are happy to be watching her. And then, like, a few shots later, it's, like, the world exploding. <laughs> like, you're just like, what the hell is this? And it's all in subtitles. So, but it's just cultish is exactly the best way to describe it so supreme well, master that's supreme master tv.com i think i'll look it up <laughs> but I'll, yeah i'll do some further research and get back to you next week but yeah i find uh yeah i find it interesting that a lot of those uh sort of restaurants adopt a interesting culture it's supreme master tv.com okay yes constructive programming for a peaceful world <laughs> but yes so that's it not it, like it's way more overt when you walk into these loving hut places like it, it, cafe gratitude you know you can read about it on their menu yeah but this is like you walk in and you see televisions immediately kind of like what is that like yeah. that's not sports center or whatever you're used to walking into a place so. whatever the government shoves down your throat to keep you quiet exactly keep you pacified right yeah yeah well thank you scott those are beautiful recommendations you're welcome i'm gonna go see the mona lisa <laughs> Good. Well, enjoy, enjoy the lube. Okay, thanks. There you have it. Uh, now we're going to join the conversation that Mark and I had. Um, we really got into a ton of stuff, and it was really interesting to uh, hear the story of uh, Glamour Kills from the first-hand perspective, and more importantly, kind of what keeps them going and keeps the desire to grow the business beyond just, obviously, financial gain. Um and our, the most important part of this conversation to me was the fact that, uh, you know, family was so important to him and that he still, even though he made decisions that obviously might go against the grain in certain respects, that, uh, you know, his family understood his passions and wanted him to pursue it. So, uh, yeah, here's our conversation and uh, hope you enjoy. Thanks. Actually, how do you pronounce your last name? I'm sorry. Oh, Mark Capricato. Capricato, okay. Capicato. Capicato, yeah. okay. It's tough. It's super Italian, a lot of syllables. It is very Italian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I am only half Italian, though. I, uh, but mother's side, well, half, uh, yeah, my mom's half Italian. Uh, like, her mom is straight off the boat, and my dad's dad is straight off the boat Italian. But the other half of me is Polish and English. Weird, oh, but. that's that's a, no, that's a good combo. I like I'm I'm Polish and Irish, and uh, I, I always I don't know if you take offense to this, um, but it, when people make um, not just like the typical Polish jokes, but like when mm-hmm. you do reveal your sort of cultural background, and people are like, "Oh, so your Polish side must be stupid," and it's just like like that seriously oh. still goes on now. I don't know if any if you've ever experienced that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, a few times. I, I think I've even jokingly made a joke about myself. Yeah, self-deprecating. Being Polish. Right. Yeah, just uh, you know, play up the play up the joke, but not. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 funny, and you know, like uh, and like Irish Irish people with drinking, and yeah, uh, you know, Italian people eating a lot of uh, bread and pasta. <laughs> these these stereotypes are hurtful. It, it can happen. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> it's just funny. I just there are certain things where it's just like. Really, like, the Polish culture hasn't been able to sort of transcend and rise above that. And, like, that's still what... Yes. <laughs> it's so, like... uh, something different can we be known for. I know, exactly. It's like, you know, they, I think they've done cool things culturally. I mean, of course, I'm ignorant and I have no idea what to, like, counter that with. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's something, though. Yeah, there there's has to be. be. There's got to be something cool. Um, yeah. 
usually I like to start these these things off with just kind of my first encounter or impression uh, or experience that I've had with like, you know, either, either a band or whatever, but obviously with you, with the clothing company and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. I just remember starting to, uh, well, this, this is probably even predating what you were doing with Glamour Kills, but it's like, I remember, I want to say it was like, it had to be like 2003 or something where, and this is more speaking about um, like clothing company and the clothing company cultural in general within the sort of, you know, whatever independent <laughs> music scene. Yeah. yeah. So like, I just remember showing up at like skate and surf festival on the East coast in Asbury park, New Jersey, when they still, well, when they had it there. Um, obviously. Yep, yep. So I just remember walking around and being like, Oh my God, who the fuck doesn't have a clothing company? Like, it, mm-hmm. it was just so like it was honestly the first time where I'd ever really seen it like sort of widespread at a festival, um, mm-hmm. and so then you know over the course of the next few years you start to see all this other stuff come out just you know um, from either people that are obviously doing their doing a brand or if it's just you know your kid in his in his basement like you were doing uh, where it's like you know here's here's just kind of what I'm doing. Um, mm-hmm. and so when I first saw Glamour Kills, like I totally lumped you guys in with that as far as like, you know, oh, like, cool. Here's another clothing company oh, totally. that totally has like, n- you know, sort of nothing to stand for, so to speak. Um, but then it gets me so stoked, like when I'm able to sort of watch, especially what you've done and like what other clothing companies have done to sort of transcend that and be like, no. We are something more than just a kid that opened up, <laughs> you know, like we're actually, yeah. I'm making clothes for a reason, like not just kind of like, oh, I don't know what else to do, so I'll make money or whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, like, so did was that super difficult for you to kind of transition out of that just being, oh, cool, here's another person with, you know, a logo and... yeah. <laughs> I, well, I mean, uh, essentially, I mean, we, we were that company and then, mm-hmm. you know, you start off... Uh, uh, you know, I, I was a little bit of a backstory. Like I yeah, yeah. kicked off my, I, I really had no, when I started Glamour Kills, I had no, uh, no vision for it. No anything. I was just a kid. I was, I was doing freelance design for, um, uh, yeah, I was 18 when I started the company. I was very involved with the music scene. All my friends were, you know, in bands aspiring to be in bigger bands. And, mm-hmm. uh, I was always the guy in the background, like helping my friends, like making their demo tapes, uh, you know, designing, uh, t-shirts, designing flyers, posters. Uh, and I like eventually, like when I was 18, 19, right out of, uh, high school, I was getting like bigger clients. Like I was, uh, designing for like plain white tees. I was like getting like a little bit of notoriety as like a freelance designer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, like the merch, uh, the merch industry, it's tough for like, you know, uh, like people to, you, you don't, the designers don't get paid very well. They just kind of, uh, you know, they're normally like younger kids, like, like myself. And, right. you know, I, I guess you get, uh, you know, a little bit of a advantage taken of, but it's, it's Oh dude, it's uh, totally, you know. the, the attitude is definitely like, Hey, what's the lowest amount that we can pay you? Like they, that's what yes. they, they don't even say that, but that's just like, Hey Mark, would you accept $400 for this? Um, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, even much, much smaller than that. And <laughs> right. I was, uh, you know, I was just, I, and I was fun just to d- getting a chance. It was, awesome just getting a chance to design for like i was stoked uh like did a design for fallout boy or matchbook romance or a band like that and i was like holy crap i got to do this and i would have did it for free you know right, at the right. time i was you know i was just really trying to make a name for myself as uh as a graphic designer and i love i love designing so i didn't i didn't really care about uh the money or anything but i did want to try to one thing that I really didn't like about the whole freelancing for other clients was I like, I very much have an idea or direction for, uh, for design. And it's tough when, you know, you kind of butt heads with somebody else. And I was like, well, I'm, you know, like the band may want, um, the band may want like X design. I think it's a terrible idea. And it, you know, and oh, they're yeah. hiring me to, to, you know, to say, I think this will look good and sell well. And I, you know, a lot of the time you run into where they want something and it doesn't always match with your vision of it. And, yeah. you know, and that's just the name of the game. And I, I loved, uh, uh, so, and so anyway, I was bored. I was like, you know, I have all these ideas for designs and stuff, but you know, I don't really have a home for them. And 
I just wanted to design them. So I, I started designing and I dabbled with like three or four shirts and, um, uh, yeah, am I wandering off this topic? No, 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 uh, no, you really? you're, no, 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 dude, you're totally fine. Cause no, I mean that, even though, like you said, you were just one of those people who it's like, yeah, you're starting a brand, like you didn't have some grand vision and that, I mean, that's fine. But like, mm. that's the same intention as like, obviously like when people start bands, like, you know, or you hope when people start bands that they're not like, okay, here's a business plan first. And then like, yeah. let's play music. Secondly, you, you had this outlet that you kind of, you were like, I needed, I, I want to get myself out there just because I have all this creative energy that I need to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's, that, that's totally makes sense. Yeah. And that's a, that's essentially what happened. I like, I was uh, 18 years old. I was going to community college, uh, not really sure like what I wanted to do. If I wanted to spend the money to go to art school, mm -hmm. uh, if I wanted to, uh, you know, where I wanted to go, like what most kids in America nowadays uh, are faced with is like, oh, you're 18 now, time to, yeah, time to figure out up. what you want to do for the rest of your life. And, <laughs> right, right. You know, that's not, you know, now that I'm uh, 26, I obviously know that that's not the case. And But, you know, it's at that time in your life, you're kind of like, oh, geez, what am I doing? And yeah. I r really had no, uh, you know, no goals. I had no master plan of like becoming a millionaire. I just, <laughs> I you just did didn't want, I had no idea that I would, you know, do this for a living. I had no intent, like I had no expectations of making these shirts and I just made uh, four or five shirts uh, and it just so happened to be the year that uh, Skate and Surf Fest became Bamboozle. Right. And I'd gone every year to Skate and Surf Fest uh, as a kid, like very involved and, and uh, loved doing it. I was like, I could, st I could show my brand here and like just sell stuff and, mm. and see what happens. And from there, it, it just kind of took yeah. off. Like people, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what drove people to want to pick up the brand, but we did, or I did fairly well and sold almost all the stock I had. And uh, what little stuff I had, I came back. I was like, what am I going to do with this stuff now? I had no real plans. I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll make a web store. And I like knew a little bit of HTML and I used like, um, I think, um, well, at first I used like just PayPal button links and built my own <laughs> website from scratch. Right, right. And, you know, one of the things that like I, I always you know not joke but I I am the designer still like it's eight years and like I'm still <laughs> involved right. daily with with not only running the company but designing and like I know like a lot of people like who start clothing companies and I'm not trying to like say there's any wrong or right way to do it but I think one difference that um, you know I, I think that really carries home to to our customers and like the I guess the the realness of Glamour Kills is that it's not just, you know, where the designs came from. And it's like, it, it, it's, I don't know. It's made from us. Like it's genuinely made by me sitting at my desk daily with mm -hmm. callous fingers and all yeah. for the love of it, you know? And I think that's our fans and like our customers know that that's, you know, if you're getting a handmade product, essentially, I mean, it's, you know, screen printed or, you know, cut and sew, it's, you know, made in, uh, you know, a factory, but like it is designed from um, the the small staff that we have here at Glamour Kills, myself, and out the door goes. And yeah, no, no, yeah. for sure, for sure. Well, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll hit on one of those points that I, uh, I, yeah, we'll, we'll pull in that string in a moment as far as like the sort of one vision type of thing, but I wanted to back up and, um, you know, you're, uh, born and raised where were you where were you born what was your uh you know kind of your, your childhood like and what your parents do i know there's a lot of questions within that but we can we can unpack that <laughs> no no totally um i was born and raised in upstate new york um a town called new windsor it's like oh i've never uh, never even heard of that in my years of touring i've never uh never a lot of a lot of people don't know i just uh, it's uh, a lot of people know Poughkeepsie as yes. far as upstate. So I always just say I'm from Poughkeepsie for, you know, for touring folk. It's like, oh, the chance. And I'm like, of course, yeah. I'm of like, course. But I'm literally like 25 minutes south of, oh, okay. uh, of Poughkeepsie, but eh, close enough. Yeah. Big enough landmark. Sure. Um, yeah. So I grew up there. Um, let's see. My mother, uh, she is, uh, well, she used to work for IBM. She has since, um, IBM was bought or part of their division was 
part of IBM was bought out by AT&T. Mm-hmm. My mother now works for AT&T, which I get a discount on uh, an iPhone, which is oh, pretty cool. There's some perks there. Yeah, that, um, is, that is a huge perk. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, man, I was like, it, it, you know what? It's not as cool of a discount as a huge corporation like AT&T you think they might give their employees. <laughs> right, but. they're like, hey, here's a 5% discount. It's like, thanks? <laughs> yeah, it's like, God, this is almost <laughs> insulting. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm saving on tax. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's it, silliness. I, you know what? Apple is... Like we, uh, like Glamour Kills, we have a like an Apple business. Uh, oh, the corporate account, yeah. The corporate account with them, and it's like, oh, and you get special like discounts and whatnot. But like we have, it's like two percent off on like things. Yeah. I'm like that's what is that? I was like, <laughs> you're, not, like, you're not getting anything. We have like twelve. No, we have like twenty max. Right. That I can see right now. It's like you gave us two percent off for buying them both. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, how, where is this sort of, you know, buy 20, get one free sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> man, this is, you know, we're supporting the hell out of you, Apple. Everybody here is using your ah, I can't. Yeah, they yeah, make yeah. a wonderful product if they're listening to this. Exactly. No, yeah. They're, anyway, they're, yeah. yeah, they're they're a direct sponsor. I get free iPhones all over the place. So I'll just give you one. Damn it. <laughs> oh, I, should, I shouldn't have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> no, no. So, you're, you're, so your mom works for AT&T. What is your... Uh... AT&T. Yep, and my dad... Um, my dad works for a low, um, well, I guess it's regional, like northeast regional uh, mm-hmm. supermarket chain oh, okay. uh, c- called uh, Shoprite, and uh, both of my parents were very, very like business savvy people. Like they were, you know, not like uh, we come from a middle class family, and they were both very, very hardworking people. Like I still to this day, like I like reference my parents. Like my mom, like takes care of everybody in our family like she's kind of like uh i I guess the glue like from somebody now that i'm older and like looking you know looking in and like seeing how like how hard she works like not only for like the company Mm -hmm. uh for at&t but like for our extended family and then like you know she still like helps out my sister and i my sister actually works uh uh for the company too but like she's on she's like how are you guys because we live uh down in new york city and uh, she's, she's upstate, but she tries to call, chime in and, uh, you guys go to the dentist. Uh, oh, you know, that's like just, amazing. Mama head. She like, Oh yeah. She's very, she's very much that. And she's also, uh, she also keeps the books, uh, for glamour kills too. Um, we, uh, you know, we have, we have an accountant we have, um, mm-hmm. or we have a CPA and, uh, but for daily bookkeeping, my mom, like she, she works for free for us. She just literally like loves, loves being a part of this and like helping out. I'm like, mom, I was like, we, you know, we want to talk about, cause she has her full-time job. Yeah. Uh, had so much going on and she's like, Oh no, I want to do this. So a lot of people, um, if you ever, you know, uh, get invoiced from Glamour Kills and you see Debbie, it's my mom. That, say hi to her. Dude, that's, <laughs> in, that's incredible. Cause it's so funny because I, I get so stoked when I hear stories like that just because um, you do hear, I mean, t- sort of a typical um, relationship that a lot of people have with their parents when it comes to sort of, you know, punk, hardcore, whatever. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. when you start to get into that, your parents have no idea what the hell it is, so they get terrified. And then, you know, yeah. there, there sometimes is that friction where you're just like, no, mom, I'm going to go to a show tonight. Screw you. <laughs> but then, mom. yeah, but then how you're able to sort of, you know, obviously grow up and grow past that. Yeah. And like, obviously, it's just awesome that your mom is, is a, just as much a part of your company as like, obviously you are. It's incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like a funny story, like she wasn't always, I mean, she was always very supportive of like my sister and I like following our dreams and like, yeah, she's like, doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter like. Uh, you know, it's okay to fail as long as you try and like try, try your hardest and like mm-hmm. really instilled that like, uh, you know, and like, I, well, I feel like in America, um, there's actually, man, I keep talking about this, but uh, I don't want to get off on a political tangent, but I feel like a lot of kids nowadays are taught that failure is not an option that, you know, if you fail, it's a bad thing. And it's like, and it kind of stifles creativity and it stifles people, you know, to want to go and, take a risk and start their own business or mm-hmm. start trying some free thinking or some creative thinking that might, I feel like it stifles a lot of people. And I, I was very lucky that my mom was very supportive uh, in, you know, letting, letting me and my sister know that like, you know, if you want to be a garbage man, 
it, there is no harm in that. You know, there's no shame to, you know, to work hard and like figure out his, uh, I guess garbage man be a bad, well, it's not a bad example if you want to, you know, if you, you want to do that. Yeah. Of, yeah. And you know, if you like, you have a weird, weird fantasy fetish for garbage and you would love nothing more than to like grab a garbage can every day. And, right. Yeah, or, you know, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that was kind of a no, like, of a, how about, an how about, example, but yeah, no. How about stamp collecting? If you're like super into stamp collecting and want to figure out a way to make a living out of that, yeah, exactly. If, you know, follow follow whatever it is that you love, and it's like money. You know, money doesn't matter as long as you wake up every day and you're alive and happy and you love what you do. Then nothing else matters. Yeah, you know, it's the truth. That's the truth. Like totally. No, I think you 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 totally just hit on an important point that I think. Like you said, a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, failure, obviously people, like you said, it's looked upon as a negative, which of course, like the act of failing at something, you know, that does suck. It, like, oh yeah. But because, I mean, anybody, yeah, anybody can attest that, that you learn more from your mistakes than you do at being successful because you don't reflect upon your success as much as you do be like, dude, what did I do there that just totally screwed the pooch or whatever? Yep. Oh yeah, and you're able to yeah exactly reflect on it and figure it out. Make yourself a better not a better per oh yeah a better person. Make yourself you know strengthen your tools and and strengthen who who you are and figure out stuff. You know you learn stuff about yourself when you fail and when you you when you don't succeed. And, you know just yeah. as I'm kind of reiterating that. No no no, but yeah, that, yeah. I, I think that's a really important point. And like the the idea that because a lot of parents like you know I, I, there's I think there's a fine line between like supporting and then coddling where it's like mm -hmm. you know if you do fail like you should know that you know like you should kind of own oh, yeah. that as opposed to you know some parents are just like oh like you know that's okay like you know we'll be can... yeah oh yeah no, oh yeah and there's totally uh there's totally a difference there but like you know to learn from it and know you failed and know you you know need to get <clears throat> you know if not to fail and to quit, but to fail and to try again. You know, yeah. and like if you're caught, you know, the fine line of coddling is, you know, um, then you just fail, you know, ah, we don't have to do this ever again. Just, you know, try something else. And it's like, right, I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you didn't, you didn't grow at all. You just moved on. Yeah. <sighs> so is but, your, uh, is, is there, there was, is there was a time uh, when my mom was, uh, you know, I was working out of the basement late nights and like, you know, she was very supportive. She was like, is this what really what you're doing? And I was like, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm working on it. She's like, you're still working. Uh, Cause for the first two years, Glamour Kills was a, a company. I was, well, a company uh, while I was working on it. I was a pizza delivery boy still. And I guess that's my last known job before Glamour Kills. It's awesome. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, uh, she was like, you, you know, you think about going to school or anything like that. I was like, well, this is, this is going to happen. I was like, I feel like it's taking off. It's going to, you know, it's going to work out. And, you know, fast forward, I'd say the first two years, uh, yeah, the first two years of the company was, I was in my mom's space in two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the end where I was like taking like professional business meetings um, at the house and my mother uh, would be, you know, she would work from home. So she'd have her laptop like in the kitchen, like working, uh, drinking coffee. And I would have like guys in business suits you know, from the bank coming to meet me or like, um, you know, or other like band managers would have to come into my, uh, my parents' house and then walk that walk through the living room, <laughs> say hi to my mom yeah. and then walk down to the basement and have a meeting. And it was, it was, uh, I, I wouldn't describe it as punk rock, but it was, uh, it was pretty DIY there. It was well, it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just a, a, Honestly, it's a modern version of the family business. Like, you know, like how you would view like, you know, a drugstore in the 50s where it's like, you know, you got little Jimmy behind the ice cream counter and then you got yep, dad yep. ringing up. It's like, this is just some different version, you know, different sort of independent version of that, you know? Yeah, it, it, exactly. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, in the digital age. Yeah, online. yeah, yeah, for sure. And so is your is your sister older or younger than you? Younger than me. Okay. Um, yeah. And then you, uh, I mean, it sounds like the way that you're obviously describing your, your family, you guys had a pretty sort of, uh, you know, I idyllic, uh, you know, uh, raising, like, you know, you guys, you guys generally got along and things were, were pretty good as far as your family life was concerned. Oh yeah, for sure. And like my, it, it really comes down to like, I, I guess I, you, you trust nobody like you trust your family. And like my sister, 
you know, like I, I try to keep my end of the business more so on the creative end. Like I'm, I'm involved daily with, I'm involved daily with a full business, but like marketing and, and, uh, art is pretty much my focus. And Michelle, uh, is the GM at the company. So she makes sure this whole shebang runs. And, you know, I realistically, like when I was looking to hire somebody, it was, it was a no brainer that, you know, she was, um, uh, she was coming out and uh, needed a job, and I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, here's this." And or well, she actually she started helping out since day one, but uh, her job as like we grew, like positions morphed, and I'm pretty sure like she's done every single job that is a position here at Glamour Kills before <laughs> anybody else did it. Yeah, but yeah. it's good because she knows how to. She has her finger on the pulse of everything, so it's right. She paid, yeah, she paved the way. Well, that that's yeah, <clears throat> that's cool. Wow, you you really do run a uh, a family operation here. That's awesome. Oh I, yeah. I, I I had an inkling that your mom. I knew your mom still had something to do with it, but I had no idea that your sister was obviously there with you as well. Yep, yeah, both of them is are, that, are in there. Is it, a, is it tough, like, uh, during holidays when you guys all get together to, like, not talk about Glamour Kills? Are you guys able to, like, uh, really put that aside? Yeah, no, it, it, we, yeah, I think we, we do a good job of balancing it uh, yeah. for, like, family functions. But then you also have, because uh, other family members know that all three of us are involved daily. So then when they have all three of us there, it's generally a topic of conversation. Sure. So it just happens. Right. But, uh, I, you know, I, we try to keep it, you know, just family Sur- talk. Surface but level, it's hard yeah. to It's hard to separate that when it is the family. <laughs> That's uh, true. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mark. How's that flying pig company you're doing? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Some, <laughs> it's it's pretty funny. Yeah. That's awesome. Some things that get said. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so um, as you were as you were going to high school and like kind of you know this is a two part question but how was your yeah. high school experience and then kind of when did because uh, like you were saying independent music was obviously a huge part of your life like when did those two kind of you know, sort of coincide? Like, I presume in high school is when you started to go to shows and sort of trip on that music scene? Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, definitely uh, in high school was when the two kind of melded together. Um, mm-hmm. I remember, I, you know, let me, let me think how I can uh, structure this answer. Okay. Because <laughs> I want to make, I was like, oh, I got two points to make. Oh, I, I love Or it. like two, two stories I want to somehow intertwine. But um <laughs> Okay. When I was uh, in 2001, I went to my first uh, show at the Chance in Poughkeepsie. I'd been to uh, like local shows, like my friend's bands uh, at VFW halls, and this is my first time. And uh, it was in 01, uh, which was now 11 years ago. Right. And it was September 12th because it was the day after September 11th. I got to go to my first uh, show in um, uh, at the Chance, and it was a uh, it was my first touring, like small show. I think I'd been to like a Blink-182 concert before and like, sure. yeah, I definitely had at that point. And like a few local shows, but my first actual like, this is it. This is an actual community. This is when it like really showed me that, you know, this is the taste of like what it is to be one of these bands and, and see this. And it was the, uh, it was dry. It was a drive through records ish tour. And it was, uh, the Benjamins, Alistair, uh, this band called Fizzlewink, who later uh, went on to be uh, Matchbook Romance. They were the openers and uh, our expandits. And I just remember uh, going to the show with uh, my best friend, uh, Mike O'Mara at the time. And me and him were, we were very involved with like music, finding new bands on mp3.com. And, uh, you know, we were very like intrigued by, you know, this subculture of like punk and pop punk and, and uh, emo for lack of a better description there. But, mm-hmm. Um, so we went there and we, uh, we pleaded his sister who was old enough to drive to, uh, take us to Poughkeepsie after, after school. And she drove us, dropped us off when we were good. And I was supposed to ask my mom to come pick us up, um, that night. And I never did. Uh, well, uh, there was some confusion. I thought he asked his mom to come pick us up and he thought that I had asked my mom so I don't know if you've ever been to Poughkeepsie or the Chance, but it's not in the nicest no. neighborhood. I was I was literally just about to say like, so you probably got mugged. 
<laughs> yes. Well, no. <laughs> well, it was uh, it was a fourteen two fourteen year old kids standing outside of the chance when the when the show got over we. Uh, we walked out and he's like, he's like, what time's your mom picking up or picking us up? I was like, I thought your mom was picking us up. Well, and we just kind of looked at each other and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> All right. So, and the, uh, so at this point it's like 1230 on a week night and we're like debating who's going to wake up whose parents to come pick us up because, uh, both parents think that we're, uh, home. Uh, so yeah, or both, or think that the other one's picking us up. So, we're sitting there, and now it's the only people there are the bands, uh, like where all the bands are parked, and me and Mike just hanging out. And uh, a few of the dudes in our expanded uh, noticed that there were like two kids just hanging out there. <laughs> right. And they came over and just started hanging. They asked like what was happening, and we explained the situation. Uh, I ended up uh, I ended up winning the argument, by the way. And his mom was coming to pick us up, but we had to wait like an hour because she had to get dressed and like get out of bed and like. Right. To begin the process to pick us up. So uh, the dudes in our expanded hall uh, sat with us, and uh, I think a couple of guys from the Benjamins and Alistair, too, were, and uh, Fizzlewink, like, all started hanging out with us, and, like, you know, they gave, they signed uh, our tickets for us. Like, they grabbed, like, free merch out of the thing and, like, you know, hooked us up, and they were, like, just goofing around, like, joking with us and having a good time. And it was, like, at that moment, I was, like, man, I was, like, this is pretty cool, like, this camaraderie, this scene, like, what – you know, these guys yeah. are just doing this because they love it. And, like, they're having the time of their lives and great people. And it was just, I guess, my in, my earliest intro to this to this scene and what it is. And, and I guess, laid the foundation of, like, my passion for it. And, uh, I don't know, and wanting to be a part of it in some facet. Right, right. So, um, yeah, that you got – you had that – direct interaction where it immediately broke any barriers because you know i mean obviously why we're attracted to independent music is that you realize that like hey the dudes that get up there on stage are pretty much exactly like me and so then when you break that barrier immediately you're just like oh thanks for hanging out with me like that's awesome yeah it's cool because you hold them on a pedestal you know watching them on a stage and you're like oh man it's like these guys must be rock stars yeah you know you can't even talk to them and then when you see that they're normal people and they have like the same, you know, same musical taste, same value, same, you know, like they, you know, they dress like you, they, you know, they talk like you and it's like, wow, these guys are yeah, pretty awesome. They're just, they're like, just dudes just like me. <laughs> yeah. Normal folks. <laughs> that's that, um, that's but, awesome. But yeah, that's, that's one story that I could say like got me, got me in. Uh, uh, I think I was a sophomore when uh, I first took a, yeah, my high school worked where it was only three years of high school. Um, freshman year, you'd take in junior high school. And so it was a – wait, that's, that's weird. Wait, is it sophomore or freshman first? I am, uh, it's, it's been a while. Oh, it's okay. You, it goes freshman year, sophomore, junior, and then senior. Okay, so sophomore, then freshman? Uh, freshman, then sophomore. That's – okay, okay. So, so my sophomore year, my first year of high school, uh, I took – uh, I signed up for graphic design courses because I was, uh, the summer before high school, um, I had started dabbling. I illegally downloaded Photoshop nice. from my friend. Hey, and, um, you know, uh, I hope Adobe, man, Apple and Adobe. I know, dude, you're, you've made so, so many me. enemies. <laughs> I don't like this. Oh, geez. <laughs> I have since bought my copies of Photoshop, if that's any, incli- yeah. any, uh, or any, uh, yeah, man, I'm. No, you're you're, you're you're fine. I I we we can put this all on me. I was the one that uh, I think this was entrapment. I think they call it. So yeah, entrapment. They, yes, yes, they can they can come at me. So yeah, you're you've you like you said you've sensed uh, you've you've paid you you paid your retribution. That's maybe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're good. We're good. Yes, no, good. Be. I'm glad. And the license numbers, everything, receipts saved somewhere. <laughs> Perfect. I can prove it all. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, where was I? Where was I? Uh, sophomore year, yes. uh, I decided to take a graphic design course. Um, we had uh, this guy also come into our junior, uh, our junior high, like pitching like the different. Uh, uh, what do you call that? Like uh, departments, I guess. It you can basically our high school was so big they made they set it up like you can major in certain things oh. or have uh, certain focuses and okay. uh this one guy that came to our high school was pitching like the visual communications and it was you know art and graphic design and like just technology and art together was the 
you know, basic, basic spiel. And I was like blown away. Uh, and the guy that came, Mr. Uh, Jeff Gebhardt, uh, he later became my teacher and he became probably my biggest, uh, uh, influence as far as like design. He taught me, I, I, he taught me everything I needed to know, like with, with programs, but then also taught me things that I still, uh, keep with me today, like with, uh, just, just going about the creative process. And he, and he taught me that like, you know, you can't teach creativity. It's, it's just not, you know, it's just not something feasible. You know, you, I can show you everything. I can show you how to, you know, techniques for drawing. I can show you how to use Photoshop. I can t show you everything. He's like, but if you, you know, unless you, you know, truly, you know, want to do this and want to be, you know, you know, and have that creative knack, mm -hmm. he's like, it, it all depends that it depends on you and you know what you want to do with it. And, uh, he later, um, you know, he would hook me up with like freelance jobs outside of, uh, uh, outside of high school. And like, oh, wow. uh, me and him actually became uh, pretty good friends. And I, um, yeah, I owe a lot to that guy actually. He's just, uh, probably That's my awesome. biggest, uh, I'd say my biggest influence as far as like getting me into what I do now. And, um, yeah, uh, that's that's that. So the with the uh, I find it interesting that you uh, you know only had three years of high school and like you, like you said it was a pretty big high school. So did you uh, yep. using <clears throat> using sort of stereotypes <laughs> from a high school level like you know were sure. you were you kind of the uh, you know indoor art kid or like what what sort of uh, uh, stereotype oh. did you find yourself fitting in? Well, school. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, school. I never went to college, and school was very like I was. I, as my schooling progressed, I think my grades got lower and lower yeah. and lower Shit. and lower. And I was like, I, not that I was dumb, and I don't want to. I'm not making excuses for myself. I think I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy. Right. Actually, I, I know I am. I, yes. I will be confident here. I'm going good. to say that. That's I know good. I'm a smart, smart dude, but I hated school. Hated uh -huh. school. Like just the, the process of actually sitting, in something where. I, it I, it just did not get me, or yeah. I did not. You didn't get see the it point. Like, yeah, I, I the only class I went to were like my art classes, uh, and I skipped a lot a lot of class. Um, <laughs> I was I'd say a popular kid. I was uh, uh -huh. yeah, I was actually I was friends with everybody. Uh, I was class nominated class clown. Oh, uh, I see. Good yeah, I was, I'm a jokester. I'm yeah. a little <laughs> little little bit of a funny guy. But sure. uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I wasn't like jock or uh i don't know it was like that kid yeah. that was friends with everybody okay. like i kept you know i didn't start any problems i made everybody laugh and right uh you know i guess if you could call high school like a game i i went through it well I, yeah i passed the social game i guess and that's good yeah yeah so yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, mean, I think I, I definitely think class clowns have the ability to, um, you know, kind of intersperse themselves in many different situations and be like, you know, everybody thinks that they're cool. Like, you know, you may not have these like, you know, deep core intimate relationships with every single sect of people, but they'll all be like, oh, no, like Mark, he's a cool dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I, that's essentially, and I had like my close core friends that like we would go to shows together, like that. Right. Like our our group of tight knit uh, friends, and I, you know, I guess we we're all pretty cool guys. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> well, we're all like, we're, we're all kind of badasses. <laughs> yeah, you know, just uh, <laughs> so trying to think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would. Uh, I was trying to think of something embarrassing that would make us sound like not badasses. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a million things. <laughs> well, well maybe, maybe this next question will elicit something. With the, well, how come? Because obviously, like, I feel like most people in high school, once they start to like go to shows and start to get exposed to that world, that yeah. you know that they 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 want to play in a band. Like they see that, and like, was that ever something that sort of interested you? No, I mean, I always, uh, you know. I never, my mom, <laughs> my mom's going to be, oh, you did play instruments. I, she, uh, <laughs> in my elementary school, they had a music class and you could take like, you could stay after school and like mm -hmm. stay with the teacher and like learn uh, certain instruments. And all my friends like signed up to do play drums and the drum teacher in our elementary school was going to uh, show them. And I pleaded, I was like, oh, I want to play drums. And my mom was like, no, no, no. The drums, what are you going to do with that? And I was like, oh, okay. 
So uh, I ended up uh, learning a little bit of piano and a very little bit of saxophone. And by a little bit of saxophone, I mean I went to like three or four classes. And actually, funny story, because uh, in my elementary school, they would give you the instrument to, to go home with. And at a very early age, oh, man, I, this kind of has a business-savvy backstory, but I'll, I'll get to that. Um, my sister and I would come home from school, and you were supposed to practice for X amount. And my mom and dad both worked, so we stayed with uh, – my sister and I, after school, would stay with my grandmother for and grandfather for, like mm, – uh, three hours until they got home from work and she would tell my grandmother to make sure that I practiced my saxophone and my grandmother would listen to to hear if I was practicing and if I wasn't she would tell me to so I would bribe my sister with like I would save like bags of potato chips or like uh, on my walk home from school I'd stop at the deli and like get a candy bar right and I would like bribe her with uh, you know or like give her my dollar from lunch money and just have her sit in the room and blow into the saxophone while I read comics or did something else. It was, <gasps> That's uh, kind of my. <laughs> so I would ha- I would basically pay her off to sit there and fake play my saxophone because my grandmother was very hard of hearing too, and like she didn't. Know, and this is my grandmother off uh, off the boat from Italy, so sure. she. I definitely got one over on her with that. So my sister was just making noise with the saxophone, and that was acceptable to her. Oh, and that, that's she a, thought it was me playing. Dude, yeah, that's. I could, it just, I could just envision that. Like, I could see you just totally hanging out, and your sister just like making all the most awful squeaks and squeals. Yeah, yeah. That's oh inc- yeah. That's incredible. And just just because oh, you'd, yeah. you'd pair off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. So I, I never got to play drums, and you know, you can ask anybody in the office or any of my friends. I literally, I, I don't, uh, I don't get to drive much anymore living in New York. But you know, when I used to own a car, I would every chance I had, I'd be air drumming in a safe manner. But right. I'm a notorious air drummer, but never, never learned. I'd say I'm, I'm a very good air drummer, but not real drums. Right, right. Maybe right. keep a little beat, but. I never, but I never had the drive to actually want to be in a band. I wanted to be. I wanted to be the guy that helped the band like under, like, I guess I've never been a manager of a band or any, you know, I never formally did anything like that, but I've always helped. uh, You know, I always just wanted to help my friends. Like I would always be the guy that shows taking photos. I'm selling merch. I design the merch. Like I just got really into being the guy that, you know, I built all my friends bands, websites, uh, uh, one time, uh, I think when I was like 13 or 14, uh, it was right when uh, Blink 182 had um, uh, just broke. Like they, they like Dude Ranch. Uh, mm-hmm. It was in between Dude Ranch and Anima, and they just released What's My Age Again, and that was so oh, you know such a big thing to so many people. And they were naked in the video. Mm-hmm. So my friends who were basically like in a Blink 182 Pennywise. Uh, Green Day cover band uh, they wanted to do uh, promo photos and they were like how funny would it be if we were naked um, in uh, with our instruments in front of our uh, private parts and I was like okay yeah that'd be really funny and I was like let's let's do this and uh, you know we'll take some photos so I was obviously the guy uh, to take the photos uh, here now I, before we did this, it was like, well, there was a debate whether should they like, you know, wear tidy whities or scrunch up their underwear and then take the, you know, not actually be naked and mm-hmm. take the photo where it just looks like it. And, uh, and one of them decided, no, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do it naked and I'm going to have, uh, you know, my bass guitar right in front of me. So he was the last one that we shot. We shot everybody like separate mm-hmm. and, uh, in front of their instruments. And we're doing it at my house, uh, taking these photos. And my mom walks in uh, while I'm taking a photo of one of my friends naked with a bass guitar in front of his yeah. genitalia. I'm oh, like, oh my god. Yeah, she <laughs> she was. My mom is super open to you know whatever. She's like, you know, Mark, if you if you are gay, and you know, a lot of people think I'm gay. I'm not gay and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm right. That's just not what you people. are. Right. So yeah, I'm very, you know, it's, 
I, I was like, oh, geez. I didn't live that down for a while because she showed my dad, and my dad was like, what? And they were they would just bust my chops about it. Like, they were like, what are you doing? Like, yeah, like, what is this? hilarious. What is, what is this this pseudo-child pornography <laughs> thing that you're, uh, you're, you're starting here? <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, and I'm a very femmy dude, so I was like, oh, I was like, well, that opened up a whole can of worms. I was like, oh, whatever. And, oh, that's that's <laughs> with incredible. My parents, was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that... that it was, that act in and of itself, like taking joke photos of your friend, uh, put your sexuality in question slash joking about it for the next few years. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's like, my, you know, my parents still bring it up sometimes. And I like uh, we have like very like I'm like I was saying, I'm, I'm a class clown. So like my mom, like, is very open to like I. I've said some things that are like not not like like malicious like yeah necessarily like using bad words but like I say like very off the wall like inappropriate things like people look there like you just said that to your mom and your mom's laughing hysterically I'm like that's what yeah, that's what we mom. do right that's that's kind of how things <laughs> roll in our house <laughs> yeah she's gotten used to my sense of humor that's, a little a little quirky that's yeah. funny um and so when i mean kind of you know tracing back to what you were saying in regards to obviously you know just operating out of your parents basement and you know you just Mm -hmm. delivering pizzas and stuff like that um you know do you feel like that moment where you were talking about where you sold at bamboozle was that kind of like the moment where it felt the most real to you or when is it like when you took it out of your parents basement or i don't know if you have that sort of it can be something as big as like an actual move or it can be as small as something like Oh my gosh! Like I sold a thousand dollars worth of merch today online, or whatever the case may be. Like you know, yeah. that, that sort of definitive moment where it was like, oh man, I guess I have to take this more seriously than I thought I was going to have to. Yeah, yeah. I'm, well, to a certain degree, on on that question, like t- still to this day, things happen. You know, it might. You know, like tomorrow we might start working with a band that I absolutely idolized. My, you know, and they're mm-hmm. coming in to, you know, do a, an acoustic in, uh, an acoustic session with us. And I'm just blown away. And it's like, good God, this is my life. And I was like, I, like I <laughs> spent my childhood worshiping, you know, we had a band, well, for instance, we had a band, uh, uh, come in a few weeks ago called braid. And I was a big braid fan, uh, growing up and, mm-hmm. uh, they haven't been a band for quite some time now. Now they're, uh, writing again and touring and, yeah. uh, we like, I became friends with, um, uh, Bob Nana, the singer and, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, a couple of the other guys and uh earlier on when they were uh when they were doing different projects and like starting different jobs and uh one of the guys Chris Broach was in a band called the Firebird Band when I started uh uh Glamour Kills and I was like oh man I was like Chris you're uh, Chris from Braid I was like oh and we ended up like talking a bunch and giving them a bunch of hooking them up with a lot of Glamour Kills and like just kind of you know sponsoring them for lack of better uh, words, but it wasn't until like five years later, mm-hmm. cause they, they, it was like a local thing he was doing. And, uh, since disbanded quickly after that, and w- like five years later, a couple of weeks, I see Chris again. I'm like, Oh man, I was like, this is crazy. And it was just one of those moments where they were performing in here. And I was like, good God. I was like, this is, yeah, this is it. So Dreams like, true, but... so like full circle, like, wow, this is weird. Yeah. And to, to me, that is the wildest, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, it, it's always awesome to see like, oh my God, we, you know, we're the number two uh, brand in uh, Zoomies for girls. It's like, wow, that's awesome. It's like we sold a lot of product, but mm-hmm. nothing like beats when you hear things like, or like if you're walking in the mall or like walking down the street and you just see somebody wearing something you made yeah. and they, it actually clicks to you that, because here, like, yeah, you're constantly selling stuff. We sell stuff online. We sell stuff to retailers. And it's like, we know people are buying it because we're a business. But to actually, like, be in the street and to see somebody wearing something you made, you made yourself, and <laughs> they actually wanted to spend the 25 30 bucks, whatever it costs, and bought it and are wearing it and think that they look good in what you're wearing, and they decided – you should be honored that they even wore that out of the house today. And it's, yeah. it's, that is like the most flattering thing. Like I, I can't even like, I get nervous around people. Like I've like literally stood next to somebody on the subway wearing uh, a Glamour Kill shirt, like shoulder to shoulder with them. And I couldn't even say anything. I was like, <gasps> Man, That's amazing. I, was, I was intimidated by it. I was like, this is, it's, it's just so, it's so humbling. It's so uh, like just, 
it's the best feeling in the world. And like, I'm almost like, I'm geeking out over this person, like staring, like, holy shit, this is so cool. Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, well, dude, I think, but yeah, I, they probably just think I'm a creep staring. And, yeah, yeah. Like, why is that guy really looking at my shirt that much? Like, you, yeah, you, you, and, can, you can buy that somewhere. You know, I get, <laughs> I get in trouble. Like, well, I don't, I don't actually get in trouble, but like, I, cause I design cr- primarily gra- this is kind of off topic, but mm-hmm. I design primarily graphic tees. So when people are wearing graphic tees, I'm always looking at shirts. Like I'm like, I'm always curious to see the print, you right. know, see, uh, see the design, whether it's ours or not. And like, if a girl's wearing a shirt, it's like generally on their chest. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I hope they don't think I'm just staring at their chest. So. Dude, that's so good. <laughs> I never and thought. Then I'm like, yeah, you're like, I just been staring at your boobs for like ten minutes, and I apologize. Yeah, and and literally, I'm not, I'm not looking at their boobs. I'm trying to see if like the registrations in order and what color pink they used for the, you know, for the lettering. I'm, yeah. you know, just I'm nerding out in my own world, and I just look dude, like how, a, how, how I just, I just, to, I totally thought of a completely. Um, you know, I mean, I, I never even thought about that as like a version of a pickup line to be like. Would you know where they got that shirt printed? Or like, you know, just <laughs> the, the girl is just like, "What are you talking? Like, what? Stop looking what? at my shirt!" Yeah, <laughs> I could, I, I'd either get slapped or, or slapped. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah that it would probably only end badly on both cases. <laughs> that's that's incredible. <clears throat> uh, oh man. Uh, uh, oh, but what? Uh, oh, but I'd say. Uh, but to your original question, the yeah. The moment I thought that uh, Glamour Kills would actually, the moment I was like, oh my God, I can, this is going to be my job. Like this can be a living was uh, the second year we did Bamboozle. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was the first year that I was at the Meadowlands and we brought, uh, I, I asked my sister or a few of my friends to come help me this year. And it was like six of us and we're sitting there and they opened doors. And I just remember watching a flood of people like we were on the back wall of the complex mm. and I just remember a boatload of people not even rushing towards the stage. Like, I don't know if you're like at warp tour or like bamboozle early and like, you just see like the kids that get there early to get to the front of the stage. Yeah. People were coming to our booth, like beat, like power walking to us. And it was like a herd of people. And I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. And I, like we had brought, I, I, I made a, a lot of stuff that year. Cause I was like, you know, it's going to be at the middle lands. It's supposed to be bigger. I, you know, I don't know what to expect, but I know I, whatever I don't sell is like, I have the web store now I can put it up. Right. Uh, we ended up selling out of everything. And I was like, this is wild. And right. we, we, we came back with nothing. And I was like, we had maybe like double extra large and like a random hoodie. And that was that. And I was like, this is crazy. And like, uh, just like literally walking all around bamboozle and like seeing people put on your stuff and like carrying around your bag. And I was like, good God. I was like, so overwhelming i'm sure yeah it was uh, it was overwhelming it was shocking i was like so, i was so happy i remember like calling my mom like uh like michelle michelle was there and like i had her in charge of like you know handling money and like uh you know making sure everybody was like you know selling quick and restocking and whatnot and i was we were like holy crap we're not gonna last like what you know uh-huh. this is this is insane that this many people are coming to our booth and like waiting on a line to come there. It's like we were a headliner. <laughs> and I remember like people like joking around, like, did you, you know, like, like glamor kills was the best selling band at bamboozle. And I was like, <laughs> God, I was like, it's so crazy. And like, even, um, I, I've had people like come up and say, this is some of the best looking band merch I've ever seen. Like at festivals or warp turns, like, Oh no, I don't know. We're just the clothing company. Mm. And you know, that's so cool. Yeah, that's oh, like man. to have that just like because it's like I I think it's something about the way that we set our expectations. Like I think if we um you know like in whatever that you do with your life where it's like if you are constantly you're prepared but you're not expecting the best, you know? You're not like, mm-hmm. "Okay, dude, I'm going to sell out of every single piece of merch w- that we bring." But if you're like, "Okay, I'm prepared. I think that we'll do well based on, you know, what we did last year. And like you said, all these other things yeah. that, you know, these factors, but then, um, to be able to like, yeah, temper those expectations with, you know, the reality that of you being a humble person that, you know, I, I think those are all things that have to be kept in mind. And like when you're sitting there being like, Oh dude, I'm going to kill it. I'm totally going to kill it this weekend. And then it's oh, like, yeah, no, <laughs> then you just fail. And like, then you're like, 
you know, that you're, you're twice as crushed because it's like you had all these things in your head. Like I just always, I always remember it cause it's like, you know, I played in bands for, you know, from like 97 till about 2005. And I always had that mentality approaching every single show that we played, you know, being on tour where it's like, okay, well I'm going to be stoked if there's like 40 kids there, you know, like yeah. always having that expectation of like, dude, the bare minimum for me to be able to like feel that this is something that like, I, I guess I'm getting something out of or like whatever, you know, like that sort of just like base level of like, I will be happy if this happens. And then to obviously have it smash through that and be like, oh, dude, there's a hundred kids here. Like, this is incredible. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a, I don't know. I've always found that to be the best mentality of approaching things. No, no it, and it totally is. Like, you, you, exactly. You want to be prepared and like if, you know, X more, you hit the nail on the head. Like if X amount of, you know, people show up to your show and you were expecting, you know, like, oh, we're going to sell this place out, yeah. a thousand cap room, you know, and it's like, you can't, you can't think that way. You just, you have to be there first and foremost for yourself. Like I, yeah. I was like, we literally went off of uh, what we did the year prior, which was extremely minimal mm-hmm. and had some stock from like our web store and stuff. And we just brought everything we had basically, or everything uh, I had and Michelle yeah, I say we. Michelle wasn't officially with the company, but right. for lack of, you know, I'll describe it as we always do. But yeah, um, yeah, we. Um, That's awesome to have yeah. that. Just to have that. Um, to have that moment of where you were just like, yeah, oh, this this feels as real as it possibly can be. <laughs> yeah, it was it was incredible. It was one of the best feelings I've ever had. Like to just sit there and and you know not. Uh, the ex, you know, obviously expectations play a big role, but you know, just mm-hmm. going from okay, this is something that I do for fun. I want to, you know, I want it to, you know, be something. If it becomes something, that's great. But you know, at that point, I, up until like literally before doors open, I was like still wondering, like, should I be going to college? Should I start looking at different career choices? Like, I still had that weight on my shoulders of, you know, am am I in this for life or am I not? And after that, I was like, you know, I called my mom. I was like, I think I'm going to, uh, cause I was still working at the pizza place and I ended up quitting, uh, the following week and doing this, uh, full time. And, you know, I like, and I'm, I always like pay homage to, uh, bamboozle because without bamboozle, like, I don't think I would have gotten, you know, the initial, like, I wouldn't have had a platform for me to get my name out there and to get the brand name out there. Like I did otherwise, like it was such a, it was such a concentrated area of like-minded people, you know, of people that would receive glamour kills very well. And like, uh, you know, potential customers and fans, like all in one spot. And I feel like if I didn't have, if bamboozle wasn't there, I would have never gotten to, you know, spread the word and like have people find out about the brand. And, uh, so, it, you know, and that, that also comes back to what I was saying before about like this scene for lack of better words, like being a community and being a, you know, like, a lot of people like helping one another out. Like I'm sure you were in a band, you know, like, yeah. Uh, you know, I could say like drive the records again, like uh, when, you know, Midtown got signed, they went ahead and helped out armor for sleep. And then they went out and helped out their other hidden plain view got signed. Like all these other bands like stemmed, you know, from other, you know, from other bands and you, you help your friends and you build this strong, strong tight knit community that everybody's a part of, whether you're a kid going to the shows or a customer buying glamour kills or, you know, me making the shirts, like, I, like, I, I think, like, everybody, like, I relate to those kids, those kids that stand out in line to watch, you know, people who buy our stuff like that, wait in line in the rain for four hours to see their favorite band, I was that kid, I was, I still am that dude, actually, let me rephrase yeah, let's, that let's, one, let's rephrase that, you know, and, yeah. you know, I, I directly, like, I get excited, because I'm like, man, I was like, I remember what, uh, you know, especially, uh, like, being younger, uh, what it was to to wait and and like do these get to go to these shows and being that stoked to see your band and you know who um you know who who speaks to you who's you know who represents you and that's you know that's still a feeling like we we try to like do all sorts of like free i think last year we did a, a pop up shop where we we had a bunch of private acoustic sessions where we like let an r s v p open for x amount of time and if People got in, they got to see, you know, like their favorite, uh, like all time low or 
uh, Chiodos or whoever right. play, you know, acoustic in front of like 40 people. And it's like that you don't, you know, all the time Lowe's playing, you know, 4,000 cap rooms now. And that's pretty impossible to, you know, ever get the chance to see all time low in a small, yeah. you know, a small intimate setting. And like, I remember those were some of my favorite things when I was a kid. Yeah. I like it, it just, it sounds, it, it's, it's very cool. I, I like, I, you know, I think this is a, a perfect point to kind of end things on where, Essentially, you know, I mean, all the stuff that you do obviously could be shallowly or could be looked at from a shallow perspective of like, oh, these are cool marketing things for Glamour Kills to do. But mm -hmm. on the flip side, like, I mean, yeah, that you can't argue that. And that is true. That's, those are all good looks. Oh, yeah. But on the flip side, all you're trying to do is create an experience that you obviously had, you know, in growing up within the scene. And it's like, that's all you want to do is just be like, hey, like, you know, connect kids on a real level that's all based around this clothing company that has obviously tried to encapsulate community as well. It, you hit the nail uh, exactly on the head. That's, you know, I, and it, it is marketing, you know, that's, yeah. you know, that's why we're a brand, you know, nobody, I mean, to, you know, to be honest, like, Nobody needs to buy my clothes. You know, do you need Glamour Kills to live? Yeah. You know, does it put a roof over your head? No. Does it sure. feed you? No. You know, nobody needs to buy clothes. I don't need to own the Nike shoes I'm wearing. Right. But, you know, because of marketing is the, you know, the reason you sell, you know, sell product. But, yeah. you know, that's one of those things where it's like, that's the reason we are here is because of things like this. And it's like, yeah, I want you guys to come away with, knowing that Glamour Kills came up with, you know, this cool marketing error, you know, Mar Glamour Kills was selling me something like, yeah, I got to see Craig there, but for Glamour Kills, it was just kind of, you know, I want them to think that we were, sorry, I said that word. I don't know. If no, you know dude, we swear, I, I swear all the time on the podcast. It's all good. All right. <laughs> fuck yeah. Yeah, fuck yeah. I'll just, I'll just. I'm just gonna edit those all in at, at random times throughout the interview now. All right, good because I did not say nearly enough fucks throughout this podcast, and <laughs> now I'm making up for lost fuck time. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> fuck any fuck fuck. All right, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. That's but uh, I, no, I just want people. I, it's something that gets me so stoked, and I see the look on people's faces when it happens. Like those are, I know, like that those are once in a lifetime memories that only. You know, it's something you'll remember, like whether you bought Glamour Kills or not and you went to the show and, you know, whether you hate us, love us, and you just went to a show or one of these intimate things, I know that those kids, that's not something you'll forget. They're 50 years from now when they're 60 and, like, all-time low is nothing but a memory to them. Like, oh, my God, they're not, you know, obviously they're not listening to songs about, you know, breaking up with, you know, you're, you know, as you get older, your priorities change or, you yeah. know, what, you know, what relates to you musically, lyrically, but still that's something that'll stick with you forever. And like, I still like remember seeing like, uh, uh, this band Captain Jack or no, um, a uh, brand new, I saw at, uh, with ha Rod Circuit at, uh, Maxwell's in, uh, Hoboken. Right. And nobody knew the fuck either one of those bands were and it was like 45 people mm -hmm. and it was right when uh your favorite weapon came out and i remember just going insane and like th to this day i still say that is the best show i've ever gotten to go to and both bands were you know wildly important to me growing up and i don't know it's awesome yeah no no that's that's so cool well Mark, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to hang out. And, um, oh, right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, dude. My, my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it in some way. There you go, my friends. Uh, thank you for joining us again. And uh, visit propertyofzach.com for all those updates that you need in your life. And, uh, yeah, uh, let's hang out next week. Thanks. Bye.